So I want to tell you guys a story. Some of you may have heard this one, or you may have heard some version of it. But to set the story up properly, I think I need to touch on a couple of things here. One is hypnotherapy. And the other, of course, is the superstition mountains of Arizona. This was written by Brian Thompson, PhD. And I think this is very important to understand. Listen to this. Recovered trauma memories and hypnosis. Contrary to popular notion of hypnosis as a tool to uncover hidden memories locked away within the recesses of the brain, there's no evidence hypnosis improves our ability to remember things that happen to us compared to non-hypnotic or regular recall. Not only is hypnosis no better than regular recall, data suggests that recall during hypnosis can actually result in the creation of more false memories than recall while not under hypnosis. Furthermore, people who recall memories under hypnosis are more likely to believe in the accuracy of these memories, regardless of whether they are true or not. It is for these reasons that many professionals working with individuals who may have been abused as children strongly caution against the use of hypnosis as a tool to try to recover possible unremembered trauma. The American Medical Association took a stand warning against accuracy of memories recovered through hypnosis in 1985. In some, we can influence some people into believing things that never happened without hypnosis, but hypnosis makes it easier and more believable. These Misunderstandings about memory and hypnosis contributed to a particular destructive period in psychotherapy. In the 1980 to 1990s, there was an epidemic of cases with well-meaning therapists, often through hypnosis, recovering memories of childhood sexual abuse that never happened. Families were ripped apart and lawsuits were filed. This included a wave of reports of what was called satanic ritual abuse. The FBI investigated thousands of reports of abuse reportedly perpetrated by satanic cults and was unable to find any corroborating evidence for it. Please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying people don't recall memories of childhood abuse later in life. In my own practice, I have had people come to see me after recalling childhood abuse they had previously forgotten. We certainly can forget events, particularly very difficult events and things we don't understand at the time. And I am very happy to work with individuals who have recalled previously forgotten memories. However, I do not and will not seek out unremembered abuse. The risk of creating the memory of something that never actually happened is too great. Now, the reason I bring this to your attention is simply because not everything is what it seems. And I'm going to tell you the story of Angie and her encounter with the lizard men of Superstition Mountains. The Superstition Mountains located in central Arizona are a prominent mountain range known for their rugged beauty and rich folklore. They are part of the larger Tonto National Forest and lie east of the Phoenix metropolitan area. They stretched 40 miles or 64 kilometers from northwest to southeast, characterized by jagged peaks, deep canyons, and steep cliffs 
the highest point reaching an elevation of 5,057 feet. These mountains are part of the Sonoran Desert, known for its unique flora and fauna. The climate is, of course, hot with arid summers and mild winters. The composition is volcanic rock with sedimentary formations and granite intrusions. This mountain range is often associated with tales of lost gold mines, hidden treasures. The most famous legend is that of the lost Dutchman's gold mine. According to the legend, a German immigrant named Jacob Waltz discovered a rich gold vein in the Superstition Mountains, but took the location's secret to his grave, leaving behind countless seekers trying to locate its whereabouts. Other than the mysteries surrounding the mountains, there is plenty of activities that people regularly engage in, such as hiking, with numerous trails ranging from easy walks to challenging climbs, rock climbing, wildlife viewing, bird watching, camping, and photography are other popular activities in the region. The wildlife in the area includes desert bighorn sheep, coyotes, wild pigs, various reptiles, and a variety of bird species. So there is the classic story of the woman who was sexually assaulted by the lizard people of Superstition Mountains. There are several versions of the story, both long and short, but I believe the account was documented by Sherry Hinkle. We're not sure about the real name of the woman, but she is known as Angie. Now the story starts off with Angie having a three-day vacation. And with only three days, like many of us, we, we want to make the most of that time off. This happened during late March, so in Arizona, it was warm and breezy. Now Angie lived in Phoenix, so she spent every day off hiking in the mountains. She really wasn't a climber, but the activity did intrigue her. She spent most of her time in the mountains hiking and collecting rocks, rose quartz, turquoise, and other stones. One day, she was hiking and spotted a shiny rock across the canyon. It shined like the reflection you would get off a mirror. So Angie knew that she would have to start heading back to her car soon, so she picked up the pace, heading for the rock she wanted to collect. After hiking all the way up there to the rim of the canyon, she noticed that the white quartz was nice and shiny, but it was too big to carry back with her. But she did end up trying to pry off a piece of the quartz. Now, while she is doing this, she notices that there is this cave off in the distance. And she's thinking, wow, there's a cave over there. I wonder if there's anything in it. Maybe something left behind by Indians, maybe an old relic or something. So she worked her way down the canyon wall and then back up to the side where the cave was. The cave wasn't that deep. It was more like an overhang or impression than a cave. She didn't find anything and she decided to enjoy the shade of the cave for a moment to take a swig from her canteen. She only has with her a tiny flashlight attached to her keychain. Enough light to look around in the cave with, but she didn't want to have to use it to get back down the mountain to her car. So she gets back up and she is getting ready to exit this cave. And as she is leaving, she notices something shiny on the ground. She leans forward to take a closer look and there was this claw-like hand reaching out to grab her hand. When it did, she of course was startled and she said, oh, you frightened me, thinking it was probably a friend of hers that was wearing some type of mask, playing a joke on her. Now this is where the story breaks up because next she finds herself waking up in her car. 
she's driving home and she doesn't know why she's driving disoriented she doesn't really know what's going on except that she went hiking the only thing she remembers is the hike up the mountain now when she gets home she has this incredible urge to take a shower and she is in there for two hours scrubbing like crazy because she's feeling a lot of anxiety at this point for some reason it's a feeling she can't shake after the shower she sits down and tries to eat her tv dinner but only picks at it she's not in the mood to watch tv so she decides to call it a night and heads to bed now she's in the bed for a few days she's not answering the door so her sister susan comes by to check on her. She obviously sees that there's something wrong, that she's sick, so she takes Angie to the doctor. The doctor says, oh, it was just some type of flu and that she'd be fine in a few days. As Susan takes Angie to her house and puts her to bed. While she's staying there, Susan notices that Angie was having nightmares every night and she would wake up screaming so it was susan's day off and she asked angie to go climbing with her up the mountain but she refused in fear she never before was afraid of those mountains she didn't even want to look at them once angie had recovered enough to go back to her apartment she went back to work at a pet store but she quit when a customer brought a lizard into the store. She couldn't figure out why the lizard frightened her so much because she was around them all the time in the desert. They never bothered her before. This is when she realized she had a deeper issue going on and needed help. So it turns out she goes to see this hypnotherapist the following week. In the very first session, he finds out that she had been raped. After a couple more sessions, he finds out that she was assaulted by reptilians. So he's thinking that her mind is trying to refuse the reality of what took place by identifying them as lizard men, trying to bend reality. But after working with her for some time, he realizes that, wow, her account is quite detailed to be something conjured by the imagination. She remembers she heard strange barking and chirping sounds near her ears. She tried to get up, but her arms and legs were stuck in this gelatinous substance. The strange noises she realized was them speaking to each other. She said she could feel a hand on the inside of her thighs. She could only open one eye just a little and she saw men with lizard faces greenish a blend of human and serpent wide slit eyes with a yellowish tint straight sided vertical pupils broad flat noses flat nostrils some of them had a very wide mouth with many folds of skin and some had small mouths with no folds. They had small, rounded ears set high on the head with no lobes. There were three ridges on the top of their cone heads that were like scales. She noticed that they were a different color than the skin on the head. Smooth faces with narrow pointed chins. Two aliens wore either a gray scarf or a wide ribbon draped over their shoulder under the soft looking ribbons they wore a white jumpsuit with an insignia that showed a dragon with a seven pointed star in the middle of it and the other men wore black robes with the same sign the tall white skinned lizard man wore a burnt orange jumpsuit with three insignia on the left side there was a black inverted triangle 
the dragon with the star and the oval with moving stars on it, like a hologram. On the right of his uniform, there were three black bars on a silver disc. On the left cuff, on the sleeve, he wore an inverted triangles with three lines cutting through them. The white-skinned alien stood next to her, who had blue eyes. She noticed that he was taller than the others, but about seven feet tall, and he didn't seem as threatening as the others. She tried to mentally cry out for help to this man, and when she did, he took a small round box and held it close to her head. Something cold touched her head, and she felt a sudden wave of calm come over her. She discovered she was in a purple oval room about 15 feet across with a low ceiling. Colors of amber and blue flashed on the wall. She could see a small counter or bench with tools on it, and in the distance, she could see something hanging, like bags hanging off of these pipes, like body bags. Then, one of the lizard men undressed and approached the end of the table. He was muscular and had scales on his chest and lower stomach, and he was aroused. He touched her and she tried to fight him off, realizing he had superhuman strength. She tried her best to fight them off, kicking and biting, but they subdued her. Today they say Angie lives a normal life in a small town near Phoenix, but she no longer climbs the mountains. She doesn't want to speak about it anymore. She refuses interviews. And all she wants is for women who haven't yet remembered their ordeal to seek help. She says she doesn't worry about what happened anymore. She doesn't know why it happened. And if they want to come get her, she can't stop them. So you guys could probably come up with your own conclusions as to what happened that day. Some reptilians dressed in robes performing some strange reptilian cult ritual. Or real men in strange robes and masks to hide their identity so that they can perform some strange reptilian cult ritual. I think one day soon we are going to figure out what this whole abduction thing has been about. And I think many people will be shocked to find out if these beings are really reptilian or just another race of human. That's all for now, folks, and there is more to come. Please visit woodwardentertainment.com and become a level one member where you can get exclusive content. Woodward TV is available to view on Rumble, and you can follow me on Instagram at J-A-E Woodward. Everyone have a great day, and if you're going out hiking alone in a place called Superstition Mountains, just remember... Stay awake, stay aware, stay safe, and I'll talk to you all soon.